Coming up on DTNS, a satellite rescue mission succeeds. Is TikTok dangerous? Reddit's founders think so. And the Smithsonian opens up millions of images for you to use for free. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, February 27th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Justin Robert Young could not be with us. He is winging his way to South Carolina to cover the uh, South Carolina U.S. presidential primary there for his show Politics, Politics, Politics. Uh, we were just talking about flipping bags on eBay. Is that what we were talking about? Yeah, like eBay, eBay would be one of the options, yes. Places yes. like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you want to get that wider conversation, uh, get rich quick. Join Good Day Internet. <laughs> <laughs> Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Well, Facebook canceled the in-person part of its F8 developer conference, which was set to take place May 5th and 6th. The company says it instead will conduct locally hosted events, videos, and live streamed content. So it probably won't make difference for us because we'll still get the announcements because we weren't going to be there in person. But uh, Microsoft announced it's going to miss its quarterly revenue guidance for the more personal computing unit as a result of the COVID-19 virus. That's the unit that includes Windows licenses and Surface device sales. Microsoft also announced its GameStack team will not attend the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco due to the COVID-19 concerns. Several of its planned sessions will also take place online on Microsoft's website March 16th through the 18th. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that Apple has lost one key supply chain executive and is about to lose another. Vice President of Manufacturing Design Nick Fortenza retired. He led a team of supply chain and operations executive. And Duco Paz Muji, who led, production, who led production operations for the iPhones and moved into AR reality efforts more than a year ago, is discussing an exit in the near future. German news outlet Deutsche Press Agentur reports that Google officially petitioned the U.S. government to let it supply its Play Store and apps on Huawei Android devices. Back in November, Microsoft got a similar license to supply Huawei with Windows 10 for use on the Chinese firm's computers. <laughs> it's a very he said, she said kind of thing going on with Apple and Huawei these days. Apple CEO Tim Cook announced that the company will open its first India store next year. Didn't realize they didn't have one, did you? Well, they don't, but they're going to have one soon. During the company's annual shareholder meeting, Cook also said that Apple will open an online store in India this year. All of our listeners in India were like, no, we were very yeah, aware. Yeah, we were well aware. <laughs> Trust us. At RSA conference, which is happening, security researchers from ESET published details of a vulnerability in Wi-Fi chips made by Broadcom and Cypress Semiconductor called Crook, with two zeros, of course, uh, that affects chips in... A lot of stuff. iPhone, iPad, Mac, Echo, Kindle, Android devices, Raspberry Pi 3, routers from Asus and Huawei. The exploit causes devices to put unsent data frames into a transmit buffer and then send them over the air using an encryption key of all zeros. Uh, and then that, you can keep repeating that until you know maybe you happen to catch something that's useful. Apple and Amazon said their vulnerability has been patched in their affected devices. All right, let's talk a little bit more about that satellite rescue. On Wednesday, Northrop Grumman's Mission Extension Vehicle, also known as MEV-1 satellite, successfully linked with the Intel Stat, Intel Sat rather, 901 satellite that only had a few months of fuel left, so it needed a little help. The Intelsat satellite was raised to an orbit of 36,000 kilometers above Earth in preparation for the link-up to avoid impacting other satellites in the event that something went wrong. The linked satellites will now move back down to 901's operational orbit. The two satellites will remain linked for the next five years, after which point MEV-1 will move to another satellite in need. A second rescue satellite for Nor Northrop Gumrin is planned, planned for launch later this year. Yeah, uh, we've talked about satellites being in danger and, and you know, uh, what do you do? Do you deorbit them? Do you put them in a graveyard orbit? But if you put them in a graveyard orbit, that starts to get uh, crowded and then that, that can cause problems yeah. if there's collisions, et cetera. Uh, so this is an interesting way to keep satellites from either having to be deorbited or put in a graveyard, uh, give them some more fuel. The Intelsat 901 wasn't built for this. They had to design the MEV-1 to kind of work with what Intelsat had and they weren't sure it was going to work. That's why they took the precaution of using what little fuel it had left to raise it up out of uh, out of orbit so that if it didn't work, it wouldn't cause any problems. But it worked. Uh, so Northrop Grumman is very pleased with themselves, and I think they have a right to be. Uh, 
they won't talk a lot about the cost. We're not sure how cost effective this is, but in a lot of ways, this was a proof of concept that they could do it. And uh, obviously, they're planning to do another one later this year. So they kind of want to prove the viability of this because they can help a lot of other satellite operators extend the life of their satellites. I I, I really love the idea of like satellite as tugboat type thing. <laughs> like, like this satellite needs fuel to the rescue. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Or it's like a little hug. Like yeah. the MEV-1 just comes up like, I got your fuel. Yeah, you're okay. And you're okay. Intelsat 901. Yeah. For five if, years, we'll all be hugging If this doesn't you. work, you'll yeah. be safe, but I think it's going to work. I am I am curious why five years. If Is that like recharging fuel enough? And, and if so, why yeah, does it take five that's... years? Uh, there are a few more questions to dig down into. But uh, So if anyone works at Northrop Grumman and can answer that or, or, or works in this industry, like feedback at dailytechnewshow.com. But uh, pretty cool to, to think that, you, you know, you can take things that that weren't built for refueling in any way and and be able to figure out a way to do it. Absolutely. Facebook has paused its election reminder function in the European Union while it addresses concerns from the Irish Data Protection Commission. Uh, the election day reminder is supposed to display a notification to users on the day of a local election uh, to remind them to go out and vote. Facebook does not explain the criteria it uses to determine if a user sees the reminder. That's where some, some of the concerns come in. Though the concerns from Ireland's DPC revolve around transparency over what personal data is collected when users engage with the feature. Uh, that would be a GDPR-like concern. I am suspicious. Uh, it may be that the Ireland DPC is using the personal data collection as a way to stop this because they have other reasons that they wouldn't have legal basis to stop them for otherwise, but you shouldn't need, if you're Facebook, to collect any information to show me a reminder, at least no additional information, right? If I've gone onto Facebook, and I've told you where I am, which millions of people do, then mm -hmm. you would know like, oh, you're in Slovakia. Slovakia is having its election. Show you the reminder. The worry that some people have, and it's not the worry that Ireland is expressing here, but the worry that some people have is that Facebook with its targeting could affect turnout by reminding people who are likely to vote for a particular candidate or right. people yeah. of an ethnicity that a would be likely to vote for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something like that. So, uh, and that has been shown to be, that has been proven that when you have these reminders from Facebook, it does increase turnout. There, there've been some studies that, that taught, you know, looked at areas where Facebook has done this and, and said, yeah, we could pretty much say that it increased turnout by this much. Uh, so that is a real concern, although there's no reason Facebook should do that. And it should be pretty easy to catch them if they did. So I go, I go back to wondering, like, what is Ireland really doing here? Are they trying to dig down into that kind of transparency and make sure they put pressure on Facebook not to do that? Uh, or or was this thing somehow collecting data when you interacted with it, which I can't imagine a good excuse why you'd want to do that? Absolutely not. I know what these banners look like. I've seen them. I think, I don't know. I don't think I've updated Facebook, so it probably still thinks I live in Los Angeles, sure. although they're smart enough. But that's the sort of thing where adding your location can be really helpful. Maybe I just want to blast out a notice to all my other friends who live in LA if I'm trying to sell my couch or whatever. There are are lots of reasons that the company knowing your location actually makes your experience better, at least for me. Uh, and you might say, oh, yeah, but if I if it knows where I live and it's reminding me to vote and maybe there's a button where you can see where your precinct is or some sort of information, that's about it. There shouldn't be any more data collection and it sh definitely shouldn't be selective when it's supposed to be based on an area in general. I mean, I guess the other way they could go about this is look at the IP address and say, oh, uh, Sarah's not listed as being in L.A., but her mm. IP address shows that she's up in Northern California. So, right, right. you know, let's let's show her the Northern California uh, result because of that. I don't know. I have also, to be fair, I have found these sorts of notices very helpful, not only from Facebook. This is not the only company that's sort of like, hey, you know, don't don't forget to vote. Have your voice heard kind of thing. Uh, but again, it, yeah, if Ireland is onto something where there is data collection that is inappropriate or some sort of manipulation that that is not of public knowledge, then they need to know. 9 to 5 Mac says that it found evidence in the latest iOS beta release of an internet recovery feature. The way it works right now is if you need to restore an iOS device's firmware from scratch, 
you need to connect it to a computer for devices like an Apple Watch or a HomePod. That means most people aren't going to bother. They're going to take it to a service provider since the devices don't have an easy way to connect to a computer. The feature 9to5Mac found is called OS Recovery and seems to work the way that the Mac OS Recovery feature does by downloading the firmware image over the internet and then installing it. Feature is not working in the beta, but it looks to 9to5Mac as if it could also work by connecting an iPhone to another iPhone by USB as well. Yeah, we had a lot of talk uh, before the show about whether who would who would need this, right? Because yeah. uh, the, one of the reasons Apple Watch doesn't have a way to connect it to a computer is that most of the people who use an Apple Watch aren't going to tinker with it. Uh, if it doesn't work, they're just going to take it into the store. And I think that's been the idea with iOS, too. Uh, whereas more people who own laptops and desktops are willing to install their own operating systems. So I like the idea that Apple might be saying, look, let's let's make it easy for you too. Like if you want to restore your your phone from scratch, right? Like you're you're giving it to your your son or your daughter, uh, and and you just want to wipe out everything that was on there uh, and start from scratch. Well, you won't have to plug it into a computer now. You can just do it on the phone. Uh, th there's there's lots of reasons people might want to do this. And not that hooking it up to a computer is super hard, but it is that thing of like, well, I got to find the cord now because I never really charge it and I never sync it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you can do it without hooking it up, you, you'll just do it. You'll do it right then. And that's really nice. I've done that a million times on Mac OS. Uh, so it would, would be nice to have that option on iOS. Yeah, I think I think you're you're correct that the feature super helpful for a certain subset of users. It's not going to be something that the 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 lion's share of of iOS users w will ever need or when presented the option necessarily want to do but uh, it's nice to have the option yeah because you can do like Biocat was pointing out you can do a secure wipe that's not the same as restoring everything from scratch if there's been something that's a little wonky sometimes you just want to go right like let's just wipe out the firmware and start again right uh, and that's what we're talking so it is a very small slice of people that that would take advantage of this, but uh, I I know a few of you out there are very excited about. It. Yeah, I mean I uh, going iPhone to iPhone to me I'm like Ugh, more of a hassle than my computer for sure, but I also have several Macs laying around, so it depends on your situation. During a roundtable discussion at an investors conference called Social 2030, Reddit CEO and co-founder Steve Huffman was asked if Silicon Valley startups had something to learn from TikTok. You know, TikTok's taking the world by storm. Everybody's loving TikTok. Freaking, uh, this is us cast doing TikToks. Like, everybody's doing TikTok. Uh, Huffman responded, I don't watch this. Is No, that's not what he said. Huffman responded, maybe I'm going to regret this but I can't even get to that level of thinking with them because I look at that app as so fundamentally parasitic, his word, that it's always listening. The fingerprinting technology they use is truly terrifying, and I could not bring myself to install an app like that on my phone. Now, you know, that's that's pretty measured language. Uh <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's almost like, what are you saying? Fingerprinting, uh, if uh, and most of you probably know this, but fingerprinting is combining things like uh, what fonts are installed, what 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 what's the graphic card type, what's the processor type, uh, together to to track you, so that even if you don't give any personal information, they can take a profile that's like this particular combination is unique to this phone, so we know that phone is using TikTok. TikTok's parent company ByteDance claims it collects this kind of data to identify malicious behavior. Um, which could be a reason that you would collect this information. It's usually not what companies that are solely concerned with protecting malicious behavior do, but it's not impossible that that could be the reason. I'm doubting it's the only reason. TikTok told TechCrunch, these are baseless accusations made without a shred of evidence uh, regarding the fact that they're fundamentally parasitic and, and the, that's it's also it, you know that's it's not really an accusation he's just like i don't like the idea of tiktok you know, it's, it's not even yeah. really ByteDance doesn't even really or tiktok i guess in this sense doesn't really need to defend itself because fundamentally Steve parasitic Huffman doesn't want to use it is an opinion not an yeah. accusation it's always listening is an accusation yeah, uh, and and that kind of implies they're listening through the microphone, which I don't think that's what he means. He means tracking. But so if he mm. means fingerprinting, they are. Uh, the fingerprinting technology is terrifying. That's an opinion. Uh, right. So so yeah, the only accusation is that they're always listening. So maybe that's what they're responding to. But I I do think 
that yes, uh, TikTok fingerprinting is not any better than any other fingerprinting, and lots of companies are doing fingerprinting out there, uh, and there's a, a constant battle to to try to reduce that through legal and public pressure and other means. I'm not sure that TikTok is worse than others or not. Maybe I'm wrong. There also is the somewhat complicated notion that, well, a Chinese company, you know, we never really know what they're doing. So no matter what they say, be cautious. And that is unfair. But uh, it, at points in time, and we've talked about some of these situations on the show before, that has come into play. So I think the fact that the CEO and co-founder of Reddit was like, this is a really bad app, is going to get some attention. Again, like you said, a lot of this is just his opinion. He doesn't have to use it. I don't yeah. even use TikTok. Uh, so, you know, I kind of read stuff like this and I'm like, hmm, sounds like it could be problematic. We'll see. But, uh, but yeah, it's not, the company doesn't need to like do a lot of damage control from this, I don't think, unless there, it really is something substantial that's found later down the road. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, my first reaction was like, oh, company that is tangentially in competition with other companies says other companies parasitic, but I guess Reddit and TikTok aren't head to head. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg said some things about TikTok. I'm like, oh, well, you were definitely uh, worried about TikTok under my yeah. name base. So. But yeah, I, I try to hold myself to a higher standard than just saying, but China. And, and to Huffman's credit, he didn't say that. Uh, he, right. didn't, he, he didn't use that as one of his things. He, he focused merely on the fingerprinting, but there is that undercurrent. Well, in kind of fun news, uh, if you like uh, the languages of love, I don't know, uh, Uber began rolling out an in-app in -app translation tool for messages between writers and drivers. That they don't need to be in love with each other. Just, you know, it's fun to be able to speak the same language, even if you don't. This uses Google Translate integration and comes as part of a larger app redesign that further clarifies a ride's arrival status. Now, speaking of Google Translate, the feature itself added support for five new languages. We've got Kim Yamwanda, that's a language uh, primarily spoken in Rwanda. Odia, that's the Indian state of Odisha, where a lot of people speak Odia. Tatar, uh, Tatarstan in Russia, and Tom, I believe uh, a few other places too. Mm -hmm. um, Turkmen from Turkmenistan. And... Uh, and Uyghur uh, from Xinjiang, uh, China, the province anyway, bringing the total languages supported up to 108. The languages will start rolling out to users today and come to iOS and Android users in the coming days. Part of the reason that these languages took so long was finding enough text to train the machine learning algorithm on and enough human speakers to refine the models. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that brought to my mind when I went to, the, when I looked at the Uber thing was uh, in Seoul, Korea, uh, when we would hail rides, if we had had to message them about like, oh, we're on the other side, or can you call me? And they didn't speak English, we, we would have been stuck. Uh, so having these kind of messages translated just for those little interactions, they don't happen all the time, but but when they do, yeah. and you're in a place where there's non-English speaking uh, drivers, uh, that that would be great. Uh, the, yeah, this, this is, it's, it's, when I'm when I'm local, there are plenty of drivers in the U.S. that I've you know there there's been some sort of a language barrier, and that's you know most okay, of the time you kind of sure. yeah the app sort of is supposed to work so that that's not too much of a hindrance, but it has definitely been an issue when traveling, especially when you get out in an unfamiliar airport and you're kind of like where do I get the Uber, and it's like the person on the other side can't necessarily speak English, nor should they if you're outside the country. And this just it just it just helps the process be a little bit smoother. Now, this idea that uh, they're finally getting to languages like the the total of these five languages that they just added is only 75 million people, which sounds like a lot in absentia. But when you compare it to the nine billion people on the planet, it's a very small percentage. Uh, and they're like, we, we needed to find better language sets to train Google Translate on. And we needed mm -hmm. humans to check it who actually spoke the language and could say, oh, yeah, that makes sense what it's putting out. So uh, really interesting to see us getting to that point getting stretched out that far with translation. Uh, I was translating a German article earlier today, and I was marveling at, at the progress we've made just in the past five, 10 years, where instead of getting kind of a broken version, I was getting a very understandable English version of, of that German language ar article. So this... This stuff is finally really coming to the fore. It, it's it's mm -hmm. one of those things where we we get the story when it's new, and everybody's like, this is amazing, but it doesn't work very well. Uh, and then by the time it works very well, we've all accepted it, and it's not interesting anymore. So I, I like to pay attention where, where at this point we're like, we're actually starting to reach the inflection point where translation, you know, machine translation is really useful.
Yeah, I, I, this is probably just a really nerdy thing that hopefully some of you won't think is super weird of me, but for fun, sometimes I try to fool Google Translate and then give it feedback as to like, here's what you did wrong just now. I'm trying to help you, little machine. Uh, this is for certain languages that I actually have like a vested interest in knowing more about, so I'm kind of going back and forth, but it is really important. And so if you have fewer folks overall, who like doing those sorts of things or are willing to do it, it's going to take a little bit longer, but progress being made. The Smithsonian published 2.8 million images and 3D models in its collection under an open access program. Not the first to do it, but this is one of the biggest ever to be done. All the images are also licensed under a Creative Commons Zero license. Remember we were talking with Scott Johnson about the guys who made the melodies and put them out under a Creative Commons Zero license. Uh, that means there's no restriction on what you can do with these. It's essentially the same as public domain. The secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Lonnie G. Bunch III, said, we are empowering our audiences, empowering them to remix, to repurpose, to reimagine all the richness we offer. We're inviting our viewers to become collaborators. The collection is also accessible by a public API with collection data hosted on GitHub, uh, because a lot of this isn't just images. It's it's data that they they hope people can mine and, and find out new things uh, about history, new things about science by using it. The Smithsonian plans to add more to the collection over time. Uh, there are things it doesn't own the copyright to, and it's a 155 million item collection. Uh, and so they would have to get permission. And there's also just other things that it takes time to scan and, and put in. So there's all kinds of reasons uh, for that. But 2.8 million, even though it's a, sm a subset of their collection, is huge. And I love that they said, look, we could have said you can't profit off this. We could have said you can't do derivative works. We could have limited it, uh, but we're not. Uh, this is the the heritage. You know, the Smithsonian Institution is run by the U.S. government. It's funded by the U.S. government for the most part, uh, and and so they're saying, look, we we are going to make what we can available for you to remix and reuse, which is in the United States where we have this incredibly long copyright period a huge boon to people who want to make creative endeavors out of older works. Yeah. I, I, I know that there, there are a lot of uses of this that I'm not even thinking of, but I'm thinking of some sort of an art installation at the Smithsonian or, or wherever it might be that makes use of this and is branded as such would be super fascinating. Yeah. Charlie you know, Parker's whether it's alto image sax. or yeah, or right. Yeah. Or some sort of 3d printed something or some, yeah, some sort of a video or, you know, all the things that is, is really fun about going to uh, particular exhibits at, at lots of museums. But yes, as you mentioned, the Smithsonian, huge. The fact that they've got uh, a very small, uh, this is, this is going to apply to what's really a very small uh, portion of the entire collection is still a really big collection. Yeah. Uh, the P squared in, in our Twitch chat makes the joke, uh, tomorrow's news, Getty Images inventory increased by 2.8 million images. Uh, yeah, it should. Getty Images should add all of these, but that doesn't mean that Getty would then own the copyright on them. These are under a Creative Commons zero license. And the best part of that is Getty can use them, Getty can sell them, uh, or not. Uh, but you, you will then also be able to go get them without having to go through Getty or anybody else. Uh, but, but that's one of the beauties of this is like, yeah, stock art people can now add this stuff to their collection and resell it. That's fine. Uh, and if you want to pay for the ease of getting it through a subscription you already have, uh, that's great. You don't have to, if you want to, if you wanted to do the work to go and get this stuff on your own and wade through it, you can do that too. Uh, that's the beauty of, of a creative Commons zero license is it frees this stuff up to say, anybody can use it any way they want. We're not going right. to police that. And that keeps those unexpected uses from not happening. Uh, there's no restriction on what someone might or might not do with it because they're like, well, that might run afoul for the license, which is something we don't see anymore at all, really. Do you feel like, besides just saying, well, good on you, Smithsonian, that's really cool, art for all, is there any other reason that this would be happening that we're just not getting? And that's just me being like asking a very pessimistic question. Yeah, I mean... I, I, don't, I don't have don't the know. answer. Yeah, yeah. I, don't th I don't... That's a great question. Uh, I, I don't think there is a downside to this. I don't either. Um, you know, I mean, at worst, somebody could be fooled into paying for something they could have got for free. But again, that could just be 
because it's more convenient to get it from the person they're paying for. Uh, at worst, they didn't know they could get it for free. So, you know, that's our job to spread the word uh, and let people know. But it's mostly upside. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Also, a big old thank you to everybody who contributes to our subreddit. You can submit stories. You can also vote on other stories. Make sure that they float to the top if you care about them. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Also, join in the conversation in our Discord. And you can do that by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com slash DTNS. Oh, we got something good in the mailbag. Yeah, Charlie wrote in about our conversation yesterday and and specifically said, you know, when Tom cites study whether the disinformation affected results of something. In this case, it was political uh, elections. Uh, he says, Tom st- he said this for many years. Charlie says, I'm reminded of the advertising problem. I know I'm wasting half my advertising budget. I just can't figure out which half. No study can identify what would have happened in the absence of the meddling, if there was meddling, just as no economic forecast can Id- identify what would have happened if conditions were different. Those who claim otherwise are at best only giving statistical statistical inference, and that can't apply in elections where each event is unique with different issues, candidates, and surrounding culture. My personal assessment, Charlie says, is that the goal of election interference is not to hurt the prospects of either Democrats or Republicans, obviously in the U.S., but to further any divisive forces. The responses could be rank preference voting, that happens in Australia, or nonpartisan primaries, like in California. To undercut our current political system simply requires manipulating the electorate to make compromise unpopular. Based on current events, it seems to be successful. I disagree with Charlie when he says no study can identify what would have happened in the absence of meddling from a certain point of view. Uh, I'm going to Obi-Wan him here. He is literally correct in the narrowest point of no study can identify what would have happened in the absence of meddling, right? Because it is an election and it is unique. But I don't think he's implying, and therefore no study should be done because we can't find out. And that's where I disagree with him. I think you can make useful statistical inferences. You can find out uh, in laboratory conditions if certain kinds of meddling tend to have an effect. Same way you can you can say uh, no one can find out what would have happened in Mrs. Smith's fourth grade class in 1977, but we can study what elementary school students tend to do in reaction to certain kinds of educational uh, attempts. So I think it's still worth studying. I think it's still worth finding out like what kinds of meddling should we be worried about? What kinds of effects could happen? I think that's very important, and I think it's useful knowledge. That said, I totally agree with Charlie that the undercutting of uh, the political system requires manipulating the electorate to make compromise unpopular, and that seems to be working. Uh, That seems to be the problem. And that's why I'm always like, let's try to figure out how we counter that. And he has some pretty good uh, responses here, ranked choice voting, uh, nonpartisan primaries, uh, as ways that might help it. And those are worth studying to to see how much effect they have had as well. Uh, But I I don't like this idea of like, well, you can just never know, so we might as well guess. I know that's not exactly what Charlie's saying, but I've seen people say that. And it's like, no, but we could know a lot more. We could make a lot more educated guesses. Uh, Well, thank you for the email, Charlie, and thanks to everybody who emails us. Uh, Your feedback is very important. Also, Extra thank you to our patrons and gr- at, <laughs> at our master and grandmaster levels. I'm so excited. I'm tripping over myself. Jeff Wilkes, Sonia Vining, and Tony Glass. Yeah, uh, if you're in the grandmaster level, pop into that Discord. Uh, I know there's only a few of you in there, but uh, we're we're doing some new album art. Uh, and I, I popped some album art ideas in there for you to look at. Uh, so do that. And there's all kinds of good things that you get if you're a patron. Uh, listen, if you're listening on the free feed, uh, first of all, the easiest thing is go to patreon.com slash DTNS, give $2 a month. If you can afford $2 a month, you won't get any more ads. Uh, and if you can afford $5 a month, uh, you'll get extra bonus shows. You'll you'll get things like today. I did an editor's desk where I just looked at the headlines in tech today and I evaluated like which ones were useful to look at, which ones you should be wary of because they might make you think something is true that isn't. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the kind of stuff we, we try to give you at patreon.com slash DTNS. 
Uh, you're never link bait to us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you've got feedback, send her over. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Oh, I bet we're going to talk some esports tomorrow because we got Jen Cutter on the show and Len Peralta will be here too. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>